I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Adam Brandt. Uh, he's an assistant professor of energy resources engineering at Stanford. And he's also the principal investigator conducting carbon capture systems analysis uh, as part of GSEP. Uh, it's called Comparing Exergy Efficiency and Electricity Costs of Various Technology Options. Overall, his research focuses on reducing the greenhouse gas impacts of energy production and consumption with a particular focus on fossil energy systems. His research includes life cycle assessment of petroleum production and natural gas extraction, uh, particularly related to unconventional fossil fuels such as oil sands, oil shale, and hydraulically fractured oil and gas resources. Uh, he also uh, is a specialist in computational optimization of uh, emissions mitigation technologies, and uh, he came to us uh, after he completing his PhD at UC Berkeley. So please join me in welcoming Adam Brandt. All right, so thank you, Sally. Um, uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to speak, and thank you, everyone in the audience, for uh, coming to hear this talk. Um, this, is a, it, this is fun for me, because this is a chance to talk about some research that I've been working on uh, for the last three years with a couple of my students, Stuart sweeney Spith and Yuchi Soon, um, uh, and also um, uh, with uh, Abel Co-PI uh, in the form of Chris Edwards. Uh, we're going to touch on some thermodynamics in this. If any of you know Chris, um, you will know uh, where to lay the blame for any mistakes in thermodynamics. Um, hint, it's not with him, it's probably with me. Um, just some motivation for, for what we're thinking about here. Um, applying CCS at scale, that is at the sort of gigaton scale to mitigate CO2 emissions or mitigate climate damage, would uh, almost certainly require economy-wide economy shifts in material and energy flows. This is the case because massive amounts of uh, material are moved in our fossil energy system. Uh, obviously, designs for CO2 capture equipment should minimize capital investment, uh, minimize material consumption, uh, and, and perhaps most importantly, minimize the energy penalties associated with the separation and storage of CO2. Importantly, we also want to avoid unintended consequences, maybe uh, framed as backfire, elsewhere in the economy or biosphere. That is, we don't want to institute large-scale changes over the course of decades and then discover uh, that there are sort of secondary or ancillary side effects that, that uh, we weren't aware of. So therefore, uh, to meet these goals, I believe that properly assessing CCS technologies requires, uh, one, understanding economy-wide environmental impacts, and two, being able to compare diverse environmental outcomes across different media and different time scales. And our analysis here, though it's applied to CCS, uh, we think is, a, is a, a pretty groundbreaking new approach to basically satisfy both of these goals for a technology. Uh, so as far as goal one, goal one, in terms of achieving an economy-wide perspective, the methodology we're going to use is called life cycle assessment. So life cycle assessment um, is a uh, technique that's been under development for some decades uh, to model economy-wide environmental impacts uh, from a technology by tracking flows of natural resources and pollutants transfer between the economy uh, and the ecosystem. Um, so here we've got an example uh, supply chain here um, on the left where we have, for example, a coal mine uh, that's sent into a coal transport system, let's say via rail, and then to a power plant. Uh, this supply chain sort of spiders out, uh, and for example, we have diesel fuel, steel, and lubricants are consumed in coal transport, and to make steel we needed to input iron, ore, and coal. Uh, you'll note there that this chain has fed back on itself. Uh, only two orders were moved from sort of the initial supply chain. Uh, it, it's actually a little problematic that the term supply chain has entered the pop popular uh, sort of terminology or, or sort of popular mindset because all of these uh, chains mathematically are much more akin to supply sort of webs that feed back on themselves. And mathematically, you can show that that's the case uh, quite profoundly uh, self-interact. Uh, so goal two, we want to compare diverse environmental impacts. So, so sort of goal one was saying, let, okay, let's cast our net across the entire economy. Goal two is to compare diverse environmental impacts. We need to think about, uh, is this resource going to have impacts on water versus air? Uh, is this resource uh, or this technology going to have impacts now or in the future? Is this going to have, for example, chronic or acute uh, health or ecosystem impacts, right? And so there's lots of dimensions along which uh, environmental impacts can vary, and trying to quantitatively and rigorously uh, compare and value these is a decades-old problem in the world of environmental assessment. Um, many schemes have been proposed. Um, there's probably five of them in, in, in common use, mostly in Europe, for uh, regulatory purposes for product manufacturing standards and sustainability standards. 
Uh, there's a variety of schemes proposed. Uh, I would say the generous way to put it is that consensus is lacking. It's actually, it's actually really hard to rigorously uh, understand how you should um, trade these things off. We have a project with the Woods Institute in collaboration with a, just as an example, uh, in collaboration with um, a civil engineering professor where we're looking at co-minimizing energy use and uh, toxic byproduct formation from MEA-based uh, capture systems because as it turns out, monoethanol amine-based capture can release highly carcinogenic nitrosamine compounds uh, into watersheds nearby the, the power plant, right? And so this is this water versus air sort of um, trade-off. Uh, Exergy for at least 30 years, and I'm sure before that, has been proposed as a unifying thermodynamic measure of potential harm from effluents. I would say my perspective is that Exergy is likely the only contender out there for a sort of a unified scientific approach to rigorously comparing these. Um, and it has many virtues, and this has literally been discussed, uh, you know, as I said, for decades. It's not clear that all the issues have been solved, but to me, it's really where uh, the action probably is. Just to explain a little bit about Exergy, Exergy is, uh, you know, you can think about it in many ways, one of which is the maximum work that can be extracted from a system, a thermodynamic system, uh, where the system contains something that you might call a resource, uh, which is out of equilibrium with a environment or a reference environment, okay? So in this case, the resource could be a natural resource such as coal, or it could be a waste stream that is out of equilibrium with the environment. It's a measure of the potential for change as the resource equilibrates with the assumed unchanging sort of background environment. It's also the useful part of energy. Uh, another sort of unfortunate uh, set of terminology is that when most people in sort of common parlance talk about energy, almost always what they're actually talking about is exergy because that's the sort of stuff that you can use up. Uh, my car is out of energy, I don't have any energy, right? That's um, the useful part of energy is what, we, is what we actually care about. And we all know, the, you know the, the total quantity of energy is actually conserved while exergy isn't. Um, exergy comes in various flavors and is variable depending on the nature of the disequilibrium between the resource and the environment. Uh, if the resource is higher than your reference environment, then your resource contains gravitational potential exergy and so on. Uh, so the exergy content of flows can be envisioned in this way. Um, we can define something called a process, which is here just sort of this gray box here. The process takes in two forms of flows. It can take in natural resources from the environment. We have our environment up here in the upper left. Um, and it can take in other inputs from other parts of the economy. Each of these uh, mass flows can have some temperature, pressure, uh, gives free energy of formation, more concentration. Um, elevation and velocity, things like this. Um, and you can use uh, those terms to basically, here on the right, I'm obviously not going to go over the equations, but you can basically use those terms uh, to compare the uh, various forms of exergy that, this, that these inputs have relative to the reference environment. The process then spits out two types of products, uh, one of which are, are wastes here on the top. Those go back towards the environment, and the other is the product output. Um, which is then traded elsewhere in the economy or used in other economic processes, okay? So for our sort of conception here, a process is, is something that takes in exergy in the form of natural resources and other products and outputs exergy uh, in the form of products and waste. The outputs are always strictly less than or equal to the inputs, actually strictly less than in a real system because all real processes destroy exergy. Um, so methods, so in order to integrate these two perspectives, we wanted to generate an economy-wide exergy model. We use something called the EcoInvent Lifecycle Analysis data set. Uh, it's a product of the early 90s from the Swiss ETH system that's since been spun out. It's a connected set of physical flows between 10,000 different processes representing the global economy and 1,700 flows of wastes and resources, resources coming into the economy uh, from the environment, waste coming out of the economy into the environment. Uh, so you can see here sort of this conception on the left, or on the, on the upper right, we have the ecosphere out here. We have the technosphere where process one is pulling some natural resources from the ecosphere and emitting some waste. Those resources are processed and sent through sub-processes or sort of downstream processes, all of which emit some waste to the environment. Uh, these two approaches have never been unified before because it's actually fairly complex. You need it to have a lot of information to compute the exergy of a flow, and these data sets are very complicated. A big advance uh, developed by my student, Stuart, uh, was a way to basically um, pre-analyze, in this 10,000 by 10,000 uh, process model of the economy, pre-analyze analog technologies, sort the impacts by their magnitude or their potential magnitude, and basically filter them so we, we actually only need to compute exergy for a relatively small number of processes, hundreds rather than tens of thousands. 
And, to, and after that, we uh, generated an extra G conversion matrix, which has very detailed sort of extra G values or extra G intensities for some flows. But the vast majority of flows, and this is not to scale, uh, the vast majority of flows are modeled as sort of uh, average uh, typical stuff. Interestingly, the industrial metabolism metaphor, if you guys heard that, is surprisingly accurate. If you look at, you know, you sort of look at the results for demanding uh, something from the economy from this model, what the economy does is basically take in carbon, take in minerals, and take in air, and emit to first order warm, slightly uh, 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 warm wastewater with slightly high, higher concentrations of some elements in it, and right, breathes out warm uh, CO2 containing exhaust. And to first order, you know, this, this looks like something an organism uh, would do. And so we can get something like 99.99999% of the mass flow with the top few hundred processes because really um, that's kind of what the economy does. Uh, my student Yuchi Soon took over uh, from Stewart to analyze a baseline CCS system. He analyzed the NETL baseline CCS system from the National Energy Technology Lab. We modeled and sized all the reactors in great detail to generate a really detailed materials bill. Here's the, flow, uh, the sort of process diagram uh, from the DOE report. Uh, here's our uh, end result. Using basically chemical engineering uh, uh, models to sort of size and, and parameterize the reactors. And we tried to make this, this sort of uh, equal to the standard NETL plant because this is commonly used in the CCS world. So just some results. So this is the baseline system. This is. Uh, the, the baseline NETL system without CO2 capture, so this is just normal coal, over the life of the planet, takes in about 1,300 petajoules of uh, natural resource exergy. Most of this, the vast majority of this, is in the form of chemical exergy of coal, but also exergy of ores, iron ores to make steel, and other input materials. This exergy is then partitioned into three uh, categories, output electricity that we care about, that's the yellow bar, that's the, the sort of final product, uh, the exergy content of waste flows, Right, the things it's putting out in the environment, and then a, a very large term of exergy destruction. Again, this is not a um, sort of a, a, not a, an ideal or reversible process. Uh, so there is um, exergy destruction involved. We're now going to attach the CCS system to it. What we see here is the required inputs of natural resource uh, exergy increase significantly. The electric output stays the same because it's been normalized, and the waste uh, bar here on the right, in the case with CCS, only drops slightly. The app plant higher heating value efficiency um, reported in the NETL baseline for coal was about 37%, dropping to about 26% when we add CCS. Taking an economy-wide exergy efficiency, and what this means is this is the exergy content of the electricity sold by the plant, okay? The plant gate or sort of the bus bar where it interacts with the grid divided by the exergy content of all natural resources brought into the plant, right, directly in the form of coal and directly in the form of iron ore and everything else that was required to build and operate that plant. And you can see these economy-wide exergy efficiencies uh, drop to 23 and 17% when you go to uh, with, uh, without and with CCS. And in fact, we had to expend 50 units of natural resource exergy for every unit of pollution reduced. Uh, this is where we were as of a few months ago, three to six months ago, and this is not a very encouraging result. We decided to dig into what was happening here. As it turns out, um, huge amounts of more material, uh, including 12 million tons of coal over the life of the plant, uh, need to be consumed um, uh, to, uh, in, uh, additionally in the CCS system than the non-CCS system, which results in parasitic uh, emission of CO2 elsewhere in the economy that claws back some of the benefit of capture and also results in additional waste heat emissions to water and air um, and additional other air pollution uh, than CCS. But that's not the whole story. And I don't actually think this is the real story. Exergy actually measures disequilibrium of a resource with an unchanging reference environment. So the mental model here is you've got some resource, right? And it's interacting with some reference environment. It can interact chemically, let's say oxidize and form a reference species. It can dissipate out into the atmosphere, right? And eventually it doesn't change the reference environment, but it's essentially been lowered thermodynamically down to this uh, equilibrium condition, this unchanging condition. This is a really poor model of what we actually care about for CO2. CO2 builds up over centuries and changes the reference environment. Current CO2 emissions around the planet are around 1,000 metric tons per second, day in, day out. 
over a century, this has caused the effective reference environment to change. This changes the energy balance of Earth's highly driven, highly non-equilibrium climate system. The Earth, as it stands now, is massively, massively thermodynamically uphill. Right? And this is the way I, th I, th I think about it. I don't know if that's the right term. Chris could, could probably specify that more carefully. That is, an alien, and sort of an alien sitting in his spaceship uh, at the edge of the solar system could look at the Earth, and they would say, something funny is going on here. There's lots of oxygen. There's lots of other stuff that we wouldn't expect if this system were sort of in a long-term uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. All that oxygen would be sucked up, forming mineral and metal oxides, forming CO2. It'd look much closer to Mars or Venus, right? And so Earth is this sort of thermodynamically, um, uh, um, uh, it's not in its ground state. Also, CO2 affects ecosystems. And it's really not clear that exergy is the right way to think about that. So we're uh, proposing, and this is where I, if I'm going to go off the rails, this is where I'll go off the rails. And so Chris hasn't seen this stuff yet, and he's my thermodynamics guru. So I'm just a, um, a brown belt, and he's the sort of the samurai master. Um, so he, he can offer some, uh, some advice here. I'm proposing augmenting this with a time-integrated exergetic impact. Uh, what I'm going to do here is highly first order because this is sort of a non-equilibrium thermodynamics problem of possibly the most challenging type you could ever imagine. And so all, all I can do here, right, the climate system is incredibly complex. Um, uh, all, all I'm doing here is sort of a first order approach. Uh, let's imagine sort of two worlds and compare them. And these worlds evolve over time. On the left-hand side, we've got sort of our cartoon world here. This is the world without emissions. We've got some uh, energy coming in from the atmosphere. And on the right, uh, B, world B, we have world with emissions, OK? And the difference between these two worlds is that the energy input uh, from the environment to the biosystems and human systems that we care about is larger because of the uh, increased uh, thermal uh, energy transfer and increased radiation from the atmosphere. Zhang and Caldera quantify this. Caldera's can here from the Carnegie Institute quantified this with a coupled climate and ocean model, where they were able to run these coupled models for thousands of years. And they said every mole of CO2 uh, results in 4.5 times 10 to the 10th joules of total warming. Compare this to the heating value of uh, pure carbon, uh, or the, you know, the energy formation of pure carbon. It's about 114,000 times more than the energy content of the coal, of oxi or oxidizing the carbon. Um, this is a, quite a problematic result. So for a first estimate of the sort of time integrated exergetic impact, this is not actually an empty slide. It may look like it. Down here on the left is the graph I just showed you three or four slides ago. You will see that uh, I shrunk that down for a reason. If we add a, again, extremely first sort of quality adjusting factor to this additional heat input to the biosphere in the human system, and here I assumed an average delta T of 1.5K over the life of the CO2 molecule. It's about 600 times, uh, or this, uh, the, basically the, the difference in waste inputs, or the waste inputs to the environment between these two worlds is about 600 times that, the exergy that we would consume in capturing CO2, okay? So from this perspective, this sort of time integrated perspective, investing some natural resource exergy and capturing the CO2 looks like a fabulous deal, right? Because we're driving the climate system, we're driving the biosystems, we're driving the, uh, the future um, uh, sort of uh, human societies thermodynamically much less than what we have to spend. You might say, does the thermodynamic quality of environmental impacts matter? Why did I adjust Caldera's factor of 100,000 for thermodynamic quality? Why didn't I just use 100,000? Uh, to illustrate this, and this is maybe where we'll get a little controversial, but I think this is a fun thought experiment. These are uh, illustrations of two things that are happening around the planet right now as we speak. On the left, we have lightning. Negative charges almost always, although not entirely. Typically, negative charges will build up on the bottom of thunderclouds, uh, store, effectively store energy in an electrostatic field between the ground uh, and the sky. When that uh, potential crosses the tens to hundreds of millions of volts, you begin to rip apart air. Air starts to ionize. Um, and you basically form a, a channel of plasma or ionized air, and then all of a sudden, in a split second, uh, this charge balance or this energy stored in an electrostatic field dissipates. Satellites uh, find that you have about 45 to 55 or 50 flashes per second around the planet average from lightning. About 80% of those are cloud to cloud or intracloud cloud 
uh, flashes equalizing the static charge within clouds. About 20% of those hit the ground that we know about. Each flash dissipates on order one gigajoule, so if we say 10 per second times one gigajoule is 10 to the 10th watts. Fun, right? So that's effectively the amount of electric potential that's being uh, sort of dissipated or equilibrated at, uh, at all times on the planet on average. Uh, world, or sort of case B, and again, these are two things that are actually happening right now. Case B, we see that radiative forcing due to CO2, according to AR5, is about 1.68 watts per meter squared, measured at the tropopause per unit meter squared of the Earth's surface. The area of the Earth is 5.1 times 10 to the fourth meter squared, so this power is of the order 10 to 15 watts. I'm not a social scientist, but I think if you went out and act, asked the public, how many of you believe in the existence of lightning? Almost everyone would say yes. How many of you believe in the existence of climate change? You get a lot of no's, despite the fact that the effective energy flux due to climate change is 10 to the fifth times larger than the constant energy flux due to lightning around the entire planet. Okay, so you can imagine a bizarre alternate world where instead of affecting the radiative balance of the, of the, of the atmosphere, CO2 caused charge to build up on clouds. In order to dissipate that charge, the lightning on the planet would need to increase by a factor of 100,000 to dissipate this charge. Again, I'm not a social scientist. I think in that world we would not be having an argument about whether or not climate change is real, okay? So again, quality matters. Lightning is about as spatially dense, temporally dense, and exergetic, uh, has a high exergetic quality factor as you can possibly imagine. The opposite is the case with radiation from climate change. It's unclear how to measure CO2 impacts um, uh, on biosystems. And I'm out of time, but I'm, I will slide into home here. Um, chemical exergy is a poor indicator of biological impacts. Sodium cyanide has a chemical exergy of 13.7 megajoules per kilogram, while canola oil has a chemical exergy of 40.6 megajoules per kilogram. The lethal dose of sodium cyanide is 200 to 300 milligrams and will kill you very quickly. I don't know what the lethal dose of canola oil is. Too much of anything will kill you, but given by how many French fries my children will eat if you put them in front of them, the, the lethal dose for canola oil is much larger than 200 milligrams. Or myself, I am known to enjoy French fries. Well, um, Various methods have been used to understand the thermodynamics of biology and basically value from a thermodynamic sense the incredible order and in, se in a sense the incredible sort of thermodynamic improbability of life existing. They'll do this, for example, by analyzing the information content of DNA strands and coming up with a multiple to the sort of energy value of just the fats and carbohydrates and proteins that we're made of. I don't know that I believe this, and I don't know that exergy is the right way to measure impacts on biosystems, but we know the answer isn't zero, so we shouldn't ignore it, right? So any unified indicator should do something about this. Uh, so some conclusions, holistic environmental assessment of new energy technologies is possible. You can cover all processes of the economy and measure impacts on a consistent thermodynamic basis. So this is really cool. I'm very excited about this. Traditional exergy analysis that people have proposed for 30 years of CO2 makes the benefit of CCS look small. Extended impact analysis that looks at changes to this sort of driven climate system that we have makes CO2 look like a wonderful deal, or CO2 capture look like a wonderful thing to do. And the thermodynamic quality of environmental impacts does matter. I think there are numerous applications of this system scale thermodynamic analysis for comparisons of other energy technologies. Um, uh, for example, we could look at solar panels and all sorts of things. So lots of fun stuff to do here. So thank you, and I'll take any questions you may have. <laughs> Quick clarifying question. So 10 to the 15th watts of lifetime radiation for all the carbon burned and released that's sitting up in the atmosphere mm -hmm. over the five times 10 to the, I missed that last, 10 to the 14th meter squared. Is there a translation that you've done as to total lifetime radiative forcing per meter square for an individual carbon molecule? That's essentially what, what um, Caldera and Zhang did. Um, and that's where they got this time integrated 100,000 times heat input, right? 
And so what they did basically is they ran a coupled, it's a very challenging problem to do actually, this is sort of why it hadn't been done before, but they ran a coupled oceans model, right, and modeling the chemical equilibrium is in the oceans, and the uptake is in carbonate and bicarbonate, the eventual settling out of CO2 uh, to form rocks and, and uh, minerals and things like this, coupled with a climate model, ran it very, uh, over very long time periods, you know, thousands of years until the model um, equilibrates and removes all the CO2, and they get the time integrated heat impact of 100,000 times the heating value of the coal. The point of the quality adjustment is that you can't just say 100,000 times the heating value of the coal because you burn coal and you create very high quality um, heat, right? And then, whereas what's coming back to us is this very gentle, um, uh, very gentle sort of, uh, it's still energy and it's a hell of a lot of energy, but it comes back to us at a very low quality gradient. Um, I think to do this right, it would require my sort of back of the envelope, you'd have to expand it. So there's been some nice observational evidence in the last six months of changes in the down, what's called the downwelling long, long, long wave radiation due to CO2 enhancements. And so they're seeing around the 12 to 13 micron, the edges of the main CO2 band, you're seeing more back radiation. And this is the first really solid experimental evidence that's published in Nature of the, the sort of the ground level forcing effect of CO2. So some of this is coming at us as heat, some of this is coming at us as you know, 12 or 14 micron infrared radiation. You'd need to, I would need to work with an atmospheric physicist or atmospheric chemist to do this right. But to first order, I just modeled it as heat so we could talk about it. But ch taking this 100,000 at face value effectively assumes that those qualities are equal and they're, and they're not. They can't drive as much change. I'm a retired engineer for decades, so okay. you're speaking to a layman. Sure. But I was having trouble following this mm -hmm. uh, in terms of your some of the statements as I think I understood them okay. and the conclusion. Uh, I, I think you said something. You're talking about the difficulty of measuring the impacts uh, on, uh, on the earth of the climate change. I think that it, you were talking about that thermodynamically and chemically. Sure. Did I get that right? Sure, yeah. Okay, and then uh, you concluded at the end that CCS was uh, unlikely to have any important impact on climate change, if I, if I understood that yeah, statement so, correctly. Yeah, so that, that was and sort I of... Didn't, and I didn't follow any connection there. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so sorry, let me, let me back up. The conclusion of the first half of the talk, using the methodologies that people have proposed for 30 years, this sort of standard exergy analysis, is that there's not that much benefit to sequestering CO2, because CO2 does not have that much exergy content relative to the atmosphere. That is this very static, bring the exhaust to equilibrium, dilute it out in the atmosphere, how much driving potential is there? That's a very sort of static, traditional, sort of simplified mental model for computing exergy. In reality, we know that many of the assumptions buried in exergy analysis don't work for CO2, like the idea that it doesn't build up or that your reference environment is always unchanging. We actually know that's the whole problem with CO2 is that the reference environment is not unchanging, right? And since 1750, we've added a lot of CO2 to the system. It's very stable over a long time period. Most, most greatest interest to me is how did you, what led you to the, conclu what led you to the conclusion that CCS was unlikely to have any important impact. Yeah, yeah, so, so that, 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 sorry, that was, that's not my conclusion. That's the conclusion that how people have been saying you should do this. You run those numbers, CCS doesn't look beneficial. You run the numbers taking into account this heat input that happens over centuries and quality adjusting it, and you get, this is the red waste, which was the bad bar in our old graph. You now add this enormous, which dwarfs the size of the original, the original graph basically, and so you get a 600 times return. Every unit of exergy you invest in scrubbing CO2, you avoid 600 times that, that amount of thermodynamic pollution, so to speak. So CCS looks bad from the first perspective, like the best deal we could possibly imagine from the second perspective. It looks fabulous. Thank Hugely you. important to do CCS if you believe this broader perspective, okay, which I do. I got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There was one other question, though. There was sure. something like, uh, uh, you, you spend 50 times the amount of resources for one, um, one unit of benefit yeah. of, on waste. Is, there, is that really? That's using the more narrow boundary, not looking at CO2 impact over time. And so that's saying the amount of natural resources you have to expend, and almost all of this is extra coal because of the inefficiency of the plant, doesn't lower your waste 
uh, outputs very much. And so you don't get much quote unquote sort of uh, reduction in the environmental drive. And then what I'm saying in sort of the second half is that actually when you do the right size of that red wedge that we're concerned about, the, the red bar, it's, it's actually huge. And, the, and okay. that's actually the whole rub of moving to a broader sort of thermodynamic assessment. I've got it. Thank time. you very much. Yeah. Sorry about that. That was, yeah. And I think we've got maybe a minute, so maybe one more. I got the microphone over here. Oh, yep. <clears throat> so um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking uh, biochar. Uh, you, the, you talked about essentially modeling. And it seems like this would be a really good candidate for a geographic information system based model of all economic activity plus all the background stuff. And that number there, I mean, you could, you could, you could reasonably show if everybody does some gardening work and buries some biochar the way they were doing in the Amazon 500 years ago, we could take geologic quantities of CO2 out of the atmosphere, and then you're saying that it's worth 600 times the amount of work that's done to do that. So that's, that could be a really nice teaching tool, as well as a nice economic modeling and planning tool for the planet. This, this would be the right way to do biochar, because it interacts with all sorts of other agricultural systems and trucking and all these things you might have to do to, bio, to do biochar at scale. So this is exactly what you'd want to do to analyze biochar. And I think the benefits would be the same or larger. You wouldn't need the trucking because you'd be doing it on a local basis as you farm and grow trees. Sure. And, and you could model both cases. And yeah. But this would be the right way to do biochar. And people have, have started on that. But I think this approach is better. I, I think we're, I think I'm done. All right. Thanks, Sally. And thank you, everyone. Feel free to find me afterwards for, for questions. So now I'd like to introduce our second speaker. Uh, this is uh, Chris Edwards. He's a professor of mechanical engineering at Stanford University. Uh, he is the exergy king. Uh, he's taught us all to appreciate the value of the exergy analysis. Uh, he performs theoretical and experimental studies of energy transformations to enable the conversion, proce conversion processes to cleaner, more efficient, more controllable than has been possible with traditional technologies. Applications have included advanced transportation, uh, advanced electric power generation with, and with carbon mitigation. Uh, he has a master's and PhD from UC Berkeley. He also spent a, a, a large portion of his career at the Sandia National Laboratory where he worked at the really highly regarded combustion dynamics facility. Uh, he was also the uh, original deputy director of the Global Climate and Energy Project and had a huge influence on how we think about all these issues. So please join me in welcoming Chris. So the, uh, the title of the talk in the program I think is The Sootless Diesel, but the first thing I need to do is tell you that what we're really after is high efficiency. Um, it's not that I'm a huge fan of diesel fuel. I'm definitely a fan of not having soot around. Um, but we want to be efficient, uh, and one of the paths to doing that and doing that in a way that's viable, economic, uh, works hard, generally successful, is to do high temperature combustion and diesel style combustion, not necessarily with diesel fuel, uh, is a key way to approaching that. Uh, this is the work of Greg Roberts and BJ Johnson who just finished their PhDs, um, and the students who are following on are Nat Oliver and uh, Barack uh, Seaton. Uh, the motivation for this really comes from looking at the heavy duty part of transportation in that if you look out into the future uh, on the projections, light duty is looking, uh, looking pretty good, particularly if you think in terms of some of the things that are developing now, uh, electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, maybe fuel cells if they come along. But the part that worries me is the heavy duty sector because we really don't see many new options. Uh, it's a tremendous growth area, and in particular, if you think about uh, the world as it develops, uh, what will happen with those economies, this is the way that goods and people get moved around. Uh, and so figuring out how to handle this challenge is one of the things that I think is uh, worthy of our time. Okay. If you look at that in terms of what it means for fuels, diesel is the fuel that people think of, but a diesel engine does not have to run on diesel fuel. Uh, diesel fuel is a portion, a cut that you take from a hydrocarbon barrel uh, that's really nice for doing this in the traditional sense. But if you do it in the sense that we do it, where we want really high efficiency, things that you would not have think of as being good diesel fuels actually become very nice fuels. In fact, in my opinion, better fuels for a diesel than diesel fuel. So I want to separate uh, the two, diesel style combustion or a diesel engine from diesel fuel. Uh, what we need to do if we're going to try and satisfy this and do it in a, uh, an efficient uh, a way that 
fosters development in a way that works for the environment. We have to handle high load. So the reason why the diesel engine is used is the harder it works, the hotter it gets, the more this style combustion likes it. You do this with a spark united engine, you get knock. Uh, when you get knock, you pull the spark back, you lose efficiency, you lose power. It's just not really the right thing to do for high load. Uh, you want it to be high efficiency. Efficiency is sort of rolled back as we've gotten better at dealing with pollutants. Um, it needs to be clean, of course, uh, and it needs to be affordable. And that's the other challenge, that as you've begun to roll back soot and NOx emissions, uh, that the cost of the after-treatment system has become very high. And so we need a better idea. Uh, okay, so where do we stand in terms of, uh, in terms of engine efficiency? Um, to the left, you have a um, Spark United uh, gasoline engine. To the right, you have a turbocharged diesel, just mildly turbocharged. And this is pretty much what we have today. Uh, looking in terms of, I can barely see this myself, and I can't read that because of the glasses. I'm going to pull the glasses off, see if I can do it this way. Um, if you look in terms of the amount that goes into work, this is an exergy breakdown. Exergy is the amount of work you can get from a resource. Then the one over to the left, that's actually modeled roughly on a Prius sitting on its sweet spot. So it would be about 38% efficient in terms of lower heating value, about 36% on an exergy basis. The other is a small board direct injection diesel, 42 or so on an exergy basis, maybe 45 um, if you do it on a lower heating value basis. The problem here is the first 20 plus percent of the work potential is gone because you do an unrestrained chemical reaction called combustion. If you do it perfectly, you kill 20 percent of your work potential just because of entropy generation uh, from the system. That's hard to go after. You can only go after it either by changing from combustion to a restrained reaction, that's what fuel cells do, or by going to extreme states. That was another program that we did for GSEP. You can get about half of that back in a combustion engine. But here's the part that really offends me. Uh, it's this part that's in heat transfer. Uh, because most of that exergy is destroyed as you go across the thermal boundary layer before you even hit the wall. And so that's just got to go. So if you go after that and you attack that with uh, thermal barrier coatings, what are called uh, low heat rejection uh, engines, uh, here's a couple of options for this. Uh, if you insulate a bunch of surfaces, so the little graphic down there shows uh, the same stuff that you spray on gas turbines, mostly YSZ, um, about a millimeter, two millimeters thick. Onto that, you can cut the heat transfer losses, but you shift most of that energy into the exhaust enthalpy. So you have to be able to take that and extract it somehow. You have to get work out of it. Some of that you can get with a turbocharger. Some of it you can get from overexpanding. I'm a big fan of overexpansion because you don't want wickedly hot exhaust hitting the turbine stage on the backside. So to the extent that you can do those linkages, you want to do it. And you can even turbo compound that. Um, if you do that, you get the bar that's over to the left. Uh, where we're starting to creep up into some interesting efficiencies in the 50% range. Uh, if you pull out all the stops and either do a bottoming cycle that's regenerative, like a steam injection cycle, or you put a full steam bottoming cycle or an organic ranking cycle, depending on the temperature that you have, then you can move over to the other side and you can get into the mid-60s uh, with this. So really what we're after is how do you get to high efficiency? Uh, reality check, can you do some of these things? You can buy a uh, turbo compounded engine from two companies, at least. Uh, I don't know, maybe GE's got one lurking in the, in the background there too, you never know with them. Uh, Detroit Diesel and Scania both sell them uh, commercially. Uh, lots of people have been looking at how you might package um, bottoming cycles. Uh, GE already does that for uh, their large engines, but uh, whether you can do it on board a vehicle is another question. People are looking at that. Uh, you, there are X-Link overexpansion packages. Honda's not selling it anymore, but they have a really nice geometry that does 1.4 times more expansion than it does compression, uh, which fits nicely. And GE has been spraying YSZ forever um, on surfaces, so I don't really think that's a huge challenge. Um, if you go after the heat transfer loss, just because I want that exergy back and I want to make it more efficient, uh, this is what it might look like. So different pieces. Uh, you definitely want to do the head and the piston for sure. You really go, got to go after the valves, you got to go after the ports, because you don't want to heat things up before they come in, and you got to transfer that enthalpy to whatever the next extraction stage is on the downside. So it's not just about in-cylinder stuff. But the other thing that you don't really care about, at least in my opinion, is you don't care so much about the liner. There was a big program in the 90s of low heat rejection engines funded by the, the Army, and it came to a couple of conclusions. Uh, ceramics are really tricky. What are you going to do about the lubricants? Um, and you got to extract this energy out of it, and the combustion was a little hard to, to deal with. In my way of thinking, you go for about half of the loss. You leave the liner alone. You leave the lubrication alone. You do the upper part, and you can get about half the heat transfer, uh, a reduction of about half, and you redeploy that. 
Uh, how do you do that? You spray stuff on. Um, so some of this is sprayed, some of this is cast. There's a whole bunch of different methods, but those are our valves, uh, bowl and piston, that's our cylinder head, and basically we've got YSZ um, on those a couple of millimeters thick. Doing the experiments becomes a, a little interesting and a little tricky, um, and it's a little interesting and tricky. We have single cylinder engines. We do all this stuff on a custom cylinder head that can take the pounding, the lack of heat transfer, all the crazy things that we, we do to it, including putting transducers and injectors in crazy places and all that good stuff. We put the coatings on it uh, and we measure what's going to happen. And it's really good in that it can tolerate all these things and do crazy research stuff. We've got fully flexible injection and VVA and all that stuff. But there's some things that you can't do uh, with a single cylinder engine. One is you can't turbocharge it because it only breathes out once every four strokes. It only breathes in once every four strokes. And it would be a ridiculously tiny turbocharger that nobody believed the results from anyway. But we can model turbochargers, so we model the turbocharger. You'll also notice that we've got tiny little valves compared to a real engine because we've got real estate for fuel injectors and everything else, and we need structural support and all that good stuff. Our intake side, we force feed it, so we're not worried about that. But the exhaust valve is small, so we have a very tight exhaust system. But that's okay. We can model around that too. So we do a combination of experiments and modeling to figure out what will happen. And that's really important. The stuff that you can easily model, we model. The stuff that you can't and you got to go to the experiment, the combustion and the heat transfer. you got to experimentally measure that. So it puts us in kind of an interesting experimental regime. Uh, so what do we do? We integrate those two together. Uh, we simulate the turbo machinery and we create simulated intake and, and exhaust states across it. We boost on the front side according to a compressor map from a turbocharger. We back pressure the exhaust to get the right amount of work with the efficiency on that. So we've kind of boxed in the combustion process uh, in between those two. Then we measure the heat transfer in the combustion process because those are so nonlinear, we're never going to model those with any sort of confidence uh, for that. And we combine it. Um, so we use our modeling to, to get back to what we think can happen in reality. Uh, in order to do that, you have to be able to model things. These are modeled and measured for the actual experimental stuff. It's not that hard to do. It's not a state-of-the-art thing anymore. I teach people how to do this in class. Um, and so we get two sets of results, the research engine results at the bottom and what they would be in a production engine, sort of reasonable friction, turbocharger, valves, uh, all that good stuff. Um, and if you look, this is one of the cases with, uh, with turbocharging. We can get the efficiency up about where it would be um, in terms of um, what our modeling would say. Uh, with a very significant increase in power density. So I don't really like the low temperature strategies. Low temperature strategies are great uh, for some emissions reductions things. They cut heat transfer, but they cut power density. And engines are supposed to work for a living, so I prefer to raise the wall temperatures and raise the uh, combustion temperature inside of it and get more work out of the engine rather than less work out of it. But basically it says that we're on track. We have a little more heat transfer than the 50% reduction that we would have wanted, but it's also sort of Gen 1 um, thermal barrier coatings and all the rest. Uh, for sure, we need to do more extraction. Turbocharging is just the minimum version, turbo compounding. We've done other experiments, but um, when you start to have significant enthalpy flows coming out of the back, as the graduate student who did this pointed out, it gets hot. Uh, and when it's hot at one bar, that's not such a big problem. But when it's four or five bar uh, and made out of mild steel and starting to creep, you have to be a little bit careful about that. Uh, but that's okay. We learned what we needed to learn um, from that. Okay, what about soot? Um, so when, I bet when I say diesel to you, that's probably the first thing you think is soot. Either soot or noise or smell or something nasty. I, that's what I think. I think soot. So here's a lovely graphic of some terrible soot. Um, here's the 30-second version of where soot comes from. You've got an injector inside the cylinder. You squirt uh, diesel fuel, pretty reactive, uh, into very hot air. It doesn't ignite immediately, so it mixes a little bit, forms a little plume. That plume goes off. Okay, it's called the premixed combustion phase. That's not our problem in terms of emissions. That's a bit of a problem if you talk about knock or being noisy in a diesel, but it's not really our problem. Our problem is when you hog the rest of the fuel in there, the mixing control phase. You've got fuel down the middle, the oxygen's on the outside. You've got to get these two to meet each other. If you don't do it, you crack the fuel. Thermodynamically, it wants to become carbon and hydrogen. Right? It's not going to get to thermodynamic equilibrium, but it's on that path, and that's what's driving it. And that's why you're going to make soot. Um, so I want to look at one of those plumes, and if you look at one of those plumes, this shows you everything you need to know. Fuel goes in over there, you suck air in as it's entrained, it makes a mixture that's wickedly rich. That cooks things, makes a whole bunch of little bits, and those bits work their way down to carbon and hydrogen and form that gunky black stuff that's called soot. So it's all inside that plume. So we're going to look at a plume. Uh, over to the left is number two diesel fuel. This is in our combustion simulator, our extreme compression device, but not being as extreme as we normally are. 
Uh, number two, diesel fuel. So a single jet out of an injector, you would normally have four or six or eight of these uh, going into the bowl. And so you see that bright sooty, that's radiation, thermal radiation from hot soot particles uh, inside of it, and that's why we have soot problems. Um, probably the easiest thing to do in terms of having diesel style combustion and not having soot is make sure that the oxygen carbon ratio is unity. If the oxygen carbon ratio is unity, you can pr be pretty sure you can avoid soot. Uh, the cheapest way to do that is to hang an oxygen in the middle of the fuel chain. It's got to be in there so that when you break the bonds, the oxygen is available. Methanol is an easy way to do that. Here's methanol on the right. Most people think methanol is not a good diesel fuel because it takes a very high temperature for it to auto-ignite. We make high temperatures. Uh, you could give me your suntan lotion and I'll get work out of it in this engine. Okay. So uh, methanol becomes a nice fuel. All kinds of things that you think are not nice fuels are actually very nice diesel fuels. I think they're better than diesel fuel. Um, Methanol does form soot, so the idea that it is a sootless fuel is incorrect. Uh, if you rearrange the exposure so you look more carefully, this is very, very clean, no additives, reagent grade stuff, uh, but you look a little more carefully at it. In the middle of the chemical soup, you will form soot, but you also burn the soot back up again. And that, of course, is the key, is to not have any net soot out. You'd also not like to not have the soot so you don't have the radiation heat transfer losses, but that's a, sort of a secondary effect. So there are some ways to, to go about this. Um, in order to figure out what happens, you need to actually measure this. Way too complicated to model. If you look at diesel and you look at methanol, you did this some time ago. Uh, diesel, as you go richer and richer, uh, put more and more fuel uh, into the charge, higher load uh, conditions. You're going to make more and more soot. Uh, traditionally, you would be limited at around 0.7, 0.75 equivalence ratio because you make that big black cloud and your combustion efficiency goes down. You would say you can't run the engine there. That would be, uh, be inappropriate. The limit is down there. So, you know, diesel is just kind of off the map unless you put a diesel particulate filter and what you're going to need to do for the NOx and, and all the rest of this. If instead we zoom up uh, and, or zoom down by a factor of 100 so that the standard is now up at the top of the page over there, we've got methanol and ethanol. And over the typical range um, that you might run a diesel, a factor of 10 below what the standards are. The nice thing about that is that if we push out from there to stoichiometric, we're still a factor of 10 below the standards. We're basically in our, our measurement limit for the methanol, uh, and we're a factor of two below even for ethanol. So now we've gone two carbons to one oxygen atom and something that is deployed. Now it's true, there's not a lot of E100 you know, out there, and that's what we're using, using here. Personally, I'd rather have wet ethanol. It'll be interesting to see whether we can do this with E15. But that's, uh, I think, going to be for Barack to figure out. Um, but the reason for, for doing that is if you can go all the way to stoichiometric operation, it means you get to use a three-way catalyst for NOx control. And that's the same three-way catalyst that's on your car, and it's pretty darn cheap compared to an SCR and a DPF system. So that's what we're after. The other thing that comes along with that, well, uh, combustion efficiency is still high. If you care about that, I'll talk to you more about that later. Uh, the other thing that comes along with pushing to stoichiometric is you get 30% more work out of the engine. So you don't go to half the power density, which is what you get with LTC approaches, you get 30% more power from the engine, from the base engine uh, in doing this. So I kind of like that. I think that's a good thing. Okay, um, where do we stand on all this? So methanol and ethanol we've looked at, uh, and what we mean by quote sootless, nothing is sootless. Sootless is whether or not you're well below what the limit is. So that's how I'm using the term here, but I don't think anything is particularly sootless in these conditions. Uh, so that we've seen. Um, interesting thing, we lost a picture in there. Now that's neat. Where did the methane picture go? Okay, well, that was a picture of methane. Um, and the picture of the methane looks uh, a lot like the methanol and ethanol picture. Uh, so while we haven't run it yet and done uh, measurements, which Nat will do wherever Nat is, um, that's probably going to be down where it's, uh, where it's below uh, the sootless limit. It's not the oxygen in that case, it's the hydrogen carbon ratio. Uh, it's the hydrogen atoms in that. But that provides a, an interesting thing, both in terms of the interest in terms of natural gas um, and a really nice test bed in terms of looking at the three-way catalyst. Uh, how do you do the control? How do you do the combustion shaping and get the stoichiometry right for balancing off the NOx emissions, which is part of our overall strategy? Um, next step, you might say, why on earth are you interested in normal propanol? Just because we're talking about three carbons to one oxygen, so pushing this to make more and more soot on the margin so you can then work on techniques to mitigate what's going to happen on the margin. Natural gas is not methane. It's got heavier stuff. It's got some C4s in there, things that are going to produce soot. Even the uh, ethanol is only a factor of two off the limit. But when we're down in that region, what can we do with multiple injections, some of the other approaches to, to get us down below where we need to be again? So uh, that would be Barack's uh, challenge for that. So a couple of conclusions. Uh, combustion can be made, so let's diesel style combustion, just don't use diesel fuel. Uh, 
Uh, or if you use diesel fuel, make it into something else. I think John might mention that in his talk uh, later on today. Transform it to another kind of fuel, like syngas. Uh, efficiencies greater than 60% are possible. Now, that's sort of a fuzzy statement. Greater than 50% without being too crazy. Uh, going over 60%, you've got to get into bottoming cycles and highly regenerative sorts of things uh, or do something completely different. It can be made stoichiometric if you want to go there. Uh, if you go to stoichiometric, you can go for an inexpensive three-way catalyst. You already have to have an oxidation catalyst on the vehicle anyway for CO and hydrocarbons, so why not go, go three-way uh, for that? And if that's the case, the output goes up by about 30%, and the cost goes down by about 30%. And that's based upon uh, heavy-duty, big-rig, uh, DPF plus SCR system, significant fraction of the cost, 30% of the cost uh, for one of those engines. Um, there's the alcohols, there's natural gas, dimethyl ether, which is the easiest one. You don't have to be high temperature for that, but we're high temperature anyway, so these all become nice things for us. Uh, syngas, by in situ reforming, uh, and probably some other interesting things could all be sootless fuels. So. Yeah. Okay. I think this is the only GSEP talk I've given that was actually on time in 15 years. Here comes the layman again. Uh, you're saying that you can make it sootless by changing the fuel. That's basically yeah. Yeah, getting away from diesel, reducing the carbon <laughs> density in the... Okay, now, yep. uh, could you go back to that, the, the diagrams where you showed the, ethanol, the methanol and the ethanol being injected, yeah. Well, th these? <clears throat> that works. Uh, sure. Now, the, uh, do I interpret this right, that uh, the, um, the fuel around the flame is uh, a hydrocarbon that is not being combusted? So right down the center of each of those plumes is the fuel. The air is so on the outside. Say that again, right down the down center, the center of the, the plumes. Where the bright light is. What yes. That's, yeah, so that's the, the combustion of the fuel. So, so hold on. So over to the left is the injector. So it's shot a jet out this way. Right. That sucked air in, which has made that big plume. Right. Right. Down the center of it is lots of fuel. There's air on the outside. They're finding each other. And stuff's cooking inside of it without oxygen, making soot. And the soot's bright yellow because it's hot, radiating soot. OK, but what, what's the blue? The blue is a laser. Um, that's Schlieren, so you can actually but see the what, motions what in the is, gas. What is it, that blue? Is it is it a uncombusted fuel? It's air. It's air. You're seeing the air because of a blue laser that's going through that's diffracting, refracting based on density gradients. So you get to see the air motions. What, what is the what's creating the uh, the soot? I presumed, and maybe incorrectly, that the soot from diesel was being created by less than, as not as efficient a combustion yep. as from ethanol, or from methanol. Yeah, that was my 30 second explanation of where soot comes from. Probably not the best in the world. Go back. Wait, okay. So, liquid comes in from the side, it vaporizes, it transfers momentum to the air, which sucks air in. So from the left hand side, we've got fuel running down the middle sucking air in, making an equivalence ratio, a local air fuel ratio that's like four times as much as you want fuel to the amount of air. So it's really rich inside. And that stuff is hot, that stuff cracks, and it goes off to start making soot. Well, I guess, you know, if, <laughs> what I'm asking myself is why don't you change the, the shape of the fuel and air and, and, and uh, ignition uh, the premixed flame coming yeah, in. Per perfect. So a lot of what you do is you try to do clever things with holes and separations to get higher entrainment rates or change the lift off of all that. Uh, and all of that is the kind of stuff that you can do to make changes uh, to the system. They will not be big enough to get diesel fuel to be sootless. You need okay. to do something much, much bigger. But those yeah. are the kinds of things that we'll need for dealing with <clears throat> variability in natural gas, E85, those kinds of things, I think. I was assuming that... And there's lots of work on that going on. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure of this statement, but with the very low cost of uh, methane, uh, I presume methanol would be cheaper fuel to make. I'm not sure that's true, methanol. Uh, 
from natural so it, gas. So it's a pretty straightforward one to make, and there have been lots of arguments about the economics of that, even for small site you know, kinds okay. of stuff, too. Yeah. I think the bigger question is just the whole infrastructure one, right? whether or not okay. we're willing to commit to a methanol infrastructure. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering if you'd had a chance to evaluate Eddie Sturman's uh, diesel in Colorado. He's well in the 60s of percent using very precise digital valves that let him you do unusual and even multi-event combustion sequences mm -hmm. with, with quite different mechanics than a conventional diesel. Yeah. So there are systems that, that can get to high efficiencies. They're typically combined cycle systems that get to those efficiencies, not simple cycle systems. Well, I doubt that, but, but I'll be happy to look at it. A quick question, Chris. Um, there is a, you, you talked about many different oxygen-containing compounds. You talked about methane. Would you like to elaborate if there's any chance LPG could be used? So that's propanes and yeah, butanes. Yeah. And it's particularly because there seems to be a large amount of LPG available at depressed pricing today. Yeah, um, I think you're, you're already kind of in the normal hydrocarbon kitty by the time you get to LPG, that things aren't gonna look that different. Um, I gotta say, my aspiration for that is to take it and make it something else on board, uh, do thermochemical recuperation and make syngas out of it, um, which I'm pretty sure is gonna be soapless. We'll have to show that. Uh, we've done the preliminary stuff on it, but you actually have to put it through an engine and measure it to, to do that. But part of what, I don't know, will you talk about that, John, or not? So there's another, another branch to this, which is take the fuel that's easily deployable and that's economic and use waste energy. We always have too much thermal energy in the exhaust and you can drive thermochemical recuperation reactions to do that. Now that's a non-trivial thing, the temperatures and pressures that are required to do that. But making syngas is an upgraded fuel. It's already carrying the oxygen on the carbon uh, and so it's a really nice fuel. Follow on to the question the gentleman uh, asked. Uh, on a chart here, you show a, essentially a line injection, and it turns into a cone with the uh, air addition. If that was to change into a plane, um, hypothetically, suppose the injector is actually able to move fast enough to where the, gen the uh, injection is done as a plane, would that reduce the uh, suit? Yeah, that kind of drops your three-dimensional mixing to two-dimensional, so I don't think that helps you. On the other hand, anything that uh, causes you to have something that's spread out and can engage the air better before the reaction zone develops around it um, is the key to dropping that equivalence ratio. And, and all that's really good stuff. So there's a ton of research going on now. I mean, that's, that's state-of-the-art stuff that's, that's happening with it. I don't think any of it is close enough to making the reductions that you need to be able to get rid of the DPF and do the kinds of stuff that we want to do while raising the efficiency. But that's speculation on, on my part. Would, would, your, would your assessment of diesel combustion be different for um, synthetic diesel from Fischer Tropes, uh, which is primarily alkanes, linear alkanes? No. Um, if anything, it tends to be a little trickier because the CT numbers are higher, so it's going to react faster, so there's going to be less entrainment. But for the same reason, that I don't think it's going to be subtle things that do it. We need to get close enough to the margin that subtle things can, can fix things. That's well into the kind of normal uh, diesel range. Uh, I used to do a lot of stuff with Fisher Cooks diesel, and it's a really nice fuel compared to normal diesel fuel, but relative to where it needs to be to get rid of diesel particulate filters, it's not close. Okay, well, I think we're uh, out of time. So Great. Thanks. Okay, we're now ready for the last speaker of this technical session, and uh, this is Eric Larson, who comes to us from Princeton University. So GSEP doesn't just involve Stanford faculty, but we've actually engaged over 60 faculty members from around the world, and so anyway, we're delighted to, to have Eric here. He's a senior research en engineer at the Energy Systems Analysis Group at the Adlinger Center for Energy and the Environment at Princeton University. Uh, he's also a senior scientist with Climate Central. His interests encompass clean and efficient energy supply and use in transportation, industry, buildings, and power generation. 
Our recent emphasis has been on the design simulation and assessment of advanced processes for convert, converting biomass and fossil fuels into clean transportation fuels and electricity with CO2 capture and storage. Uh, so please join me in welcoming him, and he will be talking about sustainable transportation energy with net negative carbon emissions. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak here, and uh, this project is one that's, that's it. This project is uh, uh, funded by GSEP, and we're, my co-investigators and I are grateful for that support. Um, uh, and it's a, it's a joint project that we're doing at uh, the, my Princeton group with uh, folks at the University of Minnesota, Dave Tillman and Clarence Lehman, um, who are on the ecology side of things. And I'll, and I'll uh, talk about how we fit to work together on this. The, the basic um, motivation for this project is we're looking at, we think that, that carbon-based liquid fuels are going to be around for quite a while still. Um, and in, uh, in order to... Uh, to, to continue in the mix, we need to decarbonize in some fashion those liquid fuels. We're not going to be able to reach that two degree target if we, if we, don't, if we continue business as usual. Um, and uh, Sally alluded in her opening comments yesterday to the IPCC's assessment that we might need negative emissions. And biomass with carbon capture and storage is, is one of the uh, more promising ways to get negative emissions. And we, so we're looking at that for liquid fuels. And biomass at the same time is a pretty scarce resource. There's not a lot of it around, so you have to be pretty uh, clever and judicious about how you use it. And, uh, and, and in the sort of a transition to a, to a fully renewable energy system, we're probably going to need some kind of a coordinated use of biomass with fossil fuels. And that idea actually led us um, to some work that we've done, did a couple of years back, where we looked at systems for making uh, synthetic hydrocarbon, uh, non-alcohol hydrocarbon fuels uh, by co-processing biomass and coal. And this, this shows you a carbon balance of, the, uh, of, the, of this kind of a system, which we analyzed in quite a bit of detail. And it shows biomass coming in here from the left side, taking carbon out of the atmosphere as it grows. We're using, in this case, some coal. We're processing this and making a Fischer Tropes uh, diesel and, and gasoline fuels and jet fuels, which then get burned uh, and emissions go to the atmosphere. We capture CO2 along the way and store it. And when you uh, get the mix of coal and biomass appropriately, uh, to, you can get to basically zero net carbon emissions to the atmosphere. And we found that 30 to 40 percent biomass would be required in this kind of a system to get to, to net zero emissions. So zero isn't, isn't, uh, uh, is, isn't good enough in the longer term. So we're going to cut out the fossil fuel. Um, and now you, you have a system that produces negative emissions. But in, in, and so we're going to be looking at some, uh, a bunch of different ideas for, for uh, processing biomass into hydrocarbon liquid fuels. Um, through this kind of a, a schematic. And we are um, adding to it one more negative emission source, which we're actually counting on our Minnesota colleagues to find for us, which is carbon storage in soil and roots as biomass grows. And we're looking particularly at growing biomass on degraded lands in the United States, which are carbon depleted as a result largely of overcropping over the years. Um, and they have found, the folks at Minnesota have found that these soils will uh, take up carbon at a pretty substantial rate as you, as, you use, as you restore them by growing biomass, which we would then harvest annually and use for energy in these kinds of systems. So the, the, the project goals um, are to, uh, to basically identify and analyze promising pathways to biomass-based um, transportation fuels with negative emissions. And one systems that we could plausibly imagine being uh, implemented at scale by mid-century, which is the time frame in which we may need these kinds of systems. Uh, and there'll be several elements within this project. There are field studies. I should say we just recently gotten started with this work, so I, don't, I won't have a lot of sort of new results to report, but I'm more to tell you about where we're headed and hopefully come back and tell you about results uh, next year. Uh, field studies of, of uh, potential for growing non-food biomass on agriculturally degraded lands in the U.S. And there's a surprisingly large amount of this 
type of land, over 450 million acres, um, according to the USDA. And, uh, and then we're going to be carrying out uh, technology assessments <coughs> in, of various routes to bioconversion, integrating both the supply side and the, and the conversion aspects of the, of the process uh, in, in, in techno-economic assessments and environmental impact assessments, um, and then assess the potential for uh, commercial deployment of different options within the time frame to mid-century. And that's, a, that's kind of a critical uh, factor in our analysis is can we get these kinds of systems out there in, at scale in, within the next you know, 35 years, which is not that far away. Um, and then take a step back and sort of quantify, try to make some estimate on what kind of a national impact we might have for the U.S. Um, and this is just a little diagram that shows how we're breaking down the work on the right-hand side. And the Minnesota is working on the uh, uh, field studies of biomass production and understanding carbon storage in roots and soils. And uh, on the left-hand side, we're doing the, the uh, process design and analysis and sort of overall integrated systems analysis. So on the process design side, these are the classes of technologies that we're planning to look at uh, in some detail, gasification-based processes, and I won't go through these in detail because I don't, won't have time, but basically all of th these three routes uh, are ones where you can make non-alcohol hydrocarbon fuels. The gasification-based systems are, are uh, basically a Fischer-Tropsch type fuel, or you can make dimethyl ether, which uh, Chris mentioned in his talk, or you can make um, uh, synthetic gasoline as well. Um, the hydro catalytic hydropyrolysis is an interesting route for, for pyrolysis uh, production of fuels, we think. Uh, it's basically doing pyrolysis in, pyrolysis in a hydrogen atmosphere, which uh, avoids some of the uh, secondary reactions that typically go on in a sort of conventional pyrolysis process. Uh, and then the third route would be biochemical processing. This might look somewhat similar to what's called cellulosic ethanol processing today, where you convert the, uh, the carbohydrates in the biomass into sugars, and then you process those sugars through some sort of, uh, in this case, it's aerobic, from, uh, aerobic uh, microbial processing uh, with various microbes, and that produces free fatty acids, which then get converted into, into hydrocarbon fuels. And in all of these designs, we're going to design systems that include carbon capture and storage, and that's something that hasn't, uh, to our knowledge, hasn't been done uh, on a sort of a self-consistent basis across a variety of different options. Um, and what's, when you're doing this kind of comparative analysis, it's, it's uh, important to have metrics to compare these, these various options. And so part of the effort is to come up with a good set of metrics that allow us to make uh, meaningful comparisons between systems. And these metrics include greenhouse metrics. They include economic metrics, ecosystem metrics, um, and then this uh, last one about commercial deployability in a, in a relevant time frame. Um, and I wanted to just show you some ideas that we have based on some of our earlier work on some of these metrics. This is uh, a combination of a, looks like it didn't turn out very well on the bottom there, um, um, illustrating sort of an, an energy balance and a greenhouse gas metric. Um, the, the biomass intensity that's a ratio of the energy in the biomass that goes into the system divided by the energy in the liquid fuel that you produce from the system. So it's, it's sort of a, an energy efficiency. Uh, and the greenhouse gas emissions index we're defining as our life cycle emissions from the system that we're interested in divided by uh, emissions from a reference system that would produce the same products. And that reference system we're taking as sort of the two, 2005 level of for example, uh, petroleum-based liquid fuels emissions. Um, and the reason we picked 2005 is because uh, that's the year against which carbon mitigation goals for the U.S. tend to be, tend to be measured. Um, and so when you look at these, uh, you can put on here different types of systems, and we've taken some numbers from the literature and some from our earlier work here. Cellulosic ethanol made from switchgrass. Uh, with or without CCS, you can see it's close to carbon neutral, that is zero, zero greenhouse gas emissions index, and you need about two and a half units of biomass energy to make a unit of liquid fuel energy. Um, fischer trope systems, these are gasification-based plants. Here we're, we're starting with corn stover as a feedstock, again, a, 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 feed, a residue feedstock that won't have uh, 
uh, the same kind of land use impacts as taking good agricultural land to grow the feedstock. Um, and what you can see here is that with, without CCS, you're close to zero on the greenhouse scale and uh, much more negative if you're on, if you have CCS included. The amount of biomass you need is about the same um, as with the cellulosic ethanol, two to two and a half units of biomass. Um, hydropyrolysis, we've done some initial um, calculations and designs on this, and it looks like it's in the same ballpark. Um, Fisher Tropes Fuels now, this is uh, incorporating the idea of root, uh, carbon storage in the roots and soils of the biomass from which you made the, the fuels, and now you can see a dramatic reduction in the, in the emissions. You're still using the same amount of biomass to make the liquid fuel, but your emissions have dropped um, much more negative than it with the other uh, sources shown there. And then the last uh, interesting points down here are when you combine um, coal with biomass um, to make liquid fuels, and now you can get, as I mentioned at the beginning, you can, if you balance the amount of biomass and coal appropriately, you can get close to zero emissions, but you've used a lot less biomass. And so this is a way to get carbon neutral fuel um, with a lot use of a lot less biomass in your biomass resource, which is scarce, is going to go a lot further. So maybe these are the kinds of system, systems that, that one would have in the, in the interim term. Um, and uh, in the longer term, we go to systems that are pure biofuel based. Um, <clears throat> economic metrics, uh, these systems are capital intensive. Uh, on the order of billions of dollars, you know, one to five billion dollars to build these kinds of plants that we're talking about. And so it's the, the more capital intensive they are, the, the, the harder they are going to be to finance and, and build. Um, internal rate of return on equity is obviously an important metric from the economic side. And then levelized cost of production of the liquid fuels is something that's easy to compare against uh, competing, for example, petroleum fuels. Um, and none of these systems, if we were to, to run through the economics today, would make any sense, probably even at the $100 a barrel oil, and we're at 50, I think, or in that order today. Um, but as we look to the future, um, the value of negative emissions is, is maybe quite a bit higher. And this is from the IPCC's fifth assessment report. It just shows the trajectory of, of uh, carbon prices that they would anticipate if, if you're trying to meet a two degree C scenario. And you can see that by mid-century, and these are a bunch of different models that were run, and so they're different numbers for, for different models, but, but the median value out in 2050 is about $200 a ton of CO2. And when you have that kind of a carbon mitigation price, then um, the economics change pretty dramatically. Um, one complicating factor in our comparisons, and we haven't quite figured out how we're gonna deal with this yet, but is that Technologies are at different levels of development at this point, and that complicates the, not only the economic analysis, but also the, the, uh, the thermodynamic analysis that we're, we're going to go through. And that's illustrated here uh, with a comparison of a couple of different cases um, that shows the levelized cost of producing these liquid fuels. In, in the, uh, sorry, in the red is uh, gasification-based systems, which basically we know how to build today. We could build these, and we're showing a range of of costs that, that reflect a range of estimates for capital costs for these systems. And then, uh, and, and those systems have a technology readiness level around seven, and TRL scale is one, for those who aren't familiar, is, is used to sort of uh, uh, categorize where a technology is on the wet path to commercial, being commercial reality, with one to nine being the scale, nine being commercially, uh, basically commercial technology. So we're at about a seven here, but here we're at a four. And the four looks a lot better right now, uh, especially at low carbon prices. Um, but, but we need to figure out a way to incorporate the uncertainty. There are ideas like chemical looping based gasification that are out there um, that may dramatically reduce the, the cost of gasification options. So we're still figuring that one out. Uh, and then land related sustainability metrics um, are important, and this was a, an article that several of us published a few years back in Science that sort of uh, said that we really need to, if we want to minimize impacts of biofuels, we have to focus on, on uh, either using agriculture degraded lands to grow the biomass and or residues. And so our focus is going to be on those kinds of feedstocks. And in, 
in turn um, will, will evaluate the, the metrics and the impacts that they have on sort of sustainability uh, with these sorts of criteria, soil productivity, uh, water and air impacts, uh, direct and indirect uh, land use impacts, um, both on greenhouse gas emissions and food production. And I wanted to, to spend just a couple minutes talking about the Minnesota work. Um, I think it's the, the folks from Minnesota could, will do a much better job of describing their activities, but it'll, this will give you a flavor of, of what they're doing. The, on, the, on the biomass production side, they, they had started an experiment over 20 years ago where they cleared a huge plot of land, scraped off the topsoil to basically simulate degraded land, and then began to run experiments on how to restore that uh, land back to productivity. Um, and they looked in particular at the idea of growing single species monocultures or growing multiple species to see what kind of impact essentially species diversity would have. And this, the database that has been built up over 20 years has a lot of information in it that, that has not been mined yet for, for lots of different uh, potential uh, reasons and one of the one of the, so they're going to be going back and mining their data to look specifically at the at data that are relevant for our project uh, as well as establishing some new trials as well which I think some of the uh, students did this past summer out in the field um, so what they found that uh, on degraded land and this is past work that, that sort of motivated this whole idea of this project is that um, when you have a diversity of mixtures on the land they store uh, carbon in roots and soil, uh, organic matter over, over time, and these are perennial crops, and it's important that the species are mixed, and I'll, and I'll show you some results. Um, here, this is, uh, let's just look at the right-hand side. This is the number of species that were planted uh, and the amount of soil carbon that was stored uh, over, well, in, in different years on the left-hand side and then sort of uh, comparing the species numbers directly here on the, on the right-hand side. And you can see that with, with higher diversity, uh, you get higher carbon storage. And these are, in, all in almost all cases, these are low input uh, systems. They're, the idea is you don't wanna, uh, uh, you're trying, the initial idea was to restore these prairie lands back to, to sort of native productivity. Um, so you're not, you're not fertilizing and things like that, but that, that may be an option if you're looking to, to, uh, to optimize biofuel systems, and we'll explore that. Um, they also, based on the 20 years of, of data, they, they, uh, it looks like this soil carbon storage is going to persist for on the order of a century or more. So it's a, it's a long time frame period, uh, uh, process, but also substantial storage uh, on an annual basis. Um, so this is, this is an ex example of the kind of thing they'll do. They'll, they'll mow the grass and, and turn it into bales. Students here measuring how much energy is in the bales, and they have data like this that we're going to be able to, to draw on. And this is the above ground results, similar sort of plot of plant species, number of species against the above ground biomass productivity. And for those of you who are familiar with these kinds of numbers, this is three to four tons per hectare per year of productivity, which is pretty low by if you're interested in, in the economics of biofuel production. But because the inputs are so low, um, the economics may, may still work out. Um, and it may be possible to, to boost those yields. Um, um, and again, it depends a lot on what the carbon, you know, the value of the carbon avoided is. Um, there's also uh, uh, data on things like um, uh, nitrate removal from the soil. Um, which, which has an impact on what the quality of the runoff water. And this again shows that the more species you have, uh, the, uh, um, the better the absorption of nitrates from the soil. And so you'll have better water quality. Um, and then they also have measures about impacts on wildlife and, and uh, animal biodiversity. So you, uh, you, you can see that in the, when the, in the growing season, you have a mixture of species, the, the wildlife tend to enjoy it, and they go out and survey how many, uh, you know, amphibians and reptiles and uh, so on that they find in the fields. They go out and catch butterflies and figure out how many butterflies there are per hectare and that sort of thing to, to basically come up with a quantitative metric for the, for the ecosystem um, sustainability. They also couple that with, with uh, small-scale uh, 
plots where they're more exhaustive in their measurements. Um, so there's a, a rich database out there, um, and, the, and the idea is that the harvesting would be done after the senescence of the, of the vegetation, after the, wild, the migratory wildlife have, have left to go, to go south and so on. So at Minnesota, I won't go through this whole list because I'm running a little bit short on time, but, the, but the, there are a number of things that we're planning to do to look specifically at how you would tailor these sorts of uh, degraded land restoration efforts to the production of biomass for biofuels. And for example, looking at fertilization, uh, looking at strategies for um, maximizing soil carbon storage, and so on. And I just wanted to mention this last bullet here is that the idea would be once we have a, a, an understanding of the, the mechanisms that are, that are involved in these processes um, to come up with a, a national level model that where we could look at areas, uh, 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 regions outside of where the actual experiments were done to, and be able to project some, some idea of how, what kind of productivity you could get. And on that basis, we can come up with a national um, sort of projection of, of the, the potential for degraded lands um, to provide biofuels for the country. And I uh, wanted to just finish with this, um, that, that national projection um, that, that uh, the folks from Minnesota will do on the biomass side will let us do these kinds of thought experiments for the U.S. as to how, um, how much of our energy, transportation energy needs we might meet in, in the mid-century time frame. And this was a, a thought experiment that, that uh, we did for the global energy assessment a couple years back at the uh, thought experiment at the global level, but it gives you an idea of where we're headed um, in our project here. This is um, the uh, transportation energy requirements in 2005. This is what was projected sort of as a business as usual scenario for by the uh, International Energy Agency to 2050. And you can see carbon emissions uh, would be roughly double under this business as usual scenario. They also proposed a, what they called a blue map scenario, which was a much more efficient world. Um, some electrification of transportation we took that blue map scenario, modified it a bit, and said, let's assume we're going to do all of our transportation with liquid fuels, and we come up with an energy demand primarily by getting much more efficient vehicles. I'll, I don't think Amory would have any problem with the efficiency levels we've assumed here. Um, and you have your transportation energy uh, is roughly what it was in 2005. And the question is, what are the carbon emissions associated with that? Could we, could we meet this kind of demand with, with biofuels? And so the, the next part of the calculation was to look at technologies that we had some understanding about. This is the idea of coal and biomass co-processing with CCS, and you get uh, basically zero emissions with those liquid fuels, as I mentioned. This is a pure biomass system with CCS, and so you have negative emissions there. Um, and then those negative emissions essentially leave room for petroleum-based, continued petroleum-based uh, fuel use to a fairly significant extent, um, and you can still end up with zero net emissions, right? And, and that was by design. We said, what, what would you have to do to get to zero emissions for the transportation system? And then how much biomass would you need to do that? We, and it turns out that the amount of biomass is roughly how much uh, biomass there is in residues around the world uh, projected for 2050. Um, and then there's a lot of degraded uh, uh, lands globally as well as in the U.S. and to use those uh, for growing grasses in the style that the Minnesotan folks are doing um, would provide the additional biomass. And, the total, and this, that biomass did, did not, we didn't include soil uh, and root carbon capture in that case. So the, the, uh, the balance might be better if we assume some carbon capture in the, in the soil and the roots there. And so the, the total is about 100 exajoules of biomass, and that's um, comfortably within most estimates of what sustainable biomass uh, supply might be globally. It's, it's, there are estimates that are out there of three or 400 exajoules per year, but so we, we feel that this is a pretty comfortable number. So it's, it looks like with, uh, despite the limited uh, availability of biomass, it can go a long way if we're both efficient about how we use it and clever about how we convert it into liquid fuels. So I think that's it. Thank you very much.
Um, so my understanding is that over you know very long um, time periods, some grassland sort of ecosystems will continue to add soil carbon. So my understanding that was that, for example, the uh, mid North America region since deglaciation has sort of continued to add um, soil carbon uh, under sort of native or um, uh, sort of traditional ecosystems. Is there a sense in which we, we, we really understand when soil carbon would stop being added or can we just, um, you know, continue to rely on this in the future as a source of, of storing carbon? I, I guess the mental model I have is things like peat where, you know, carbon is deposited and effectively stored there for what look like geologic time scales. Um, so, so why would this stop and can we rely, this, rely on this um, in even longer term than, than we currently think? Yeah, I won't be able to give you a complete answer that I think the folks at Minnesota would be able to, but the, the, the modeling that they've done that I've seen is based on the, specifically on these degraded lands and looking, and that they showed that uh, after about 150 or 200 years, you sort of level off the carbon um, storage in those types of lands. I don't... Um, uh, I, I think at some point there, there becomes an equilibrium, but I don't know where that, where that is. Uh, <clears throat> I think you are conservative on the demand side because our, our biofuels number was about 3 million barrels a day for the U.S. or six, six exajoules a year in 2050. But I, I'm very intrigued by the ecological results, which are reminiscent of the Land Institute's perennial polyculture in Salida, Kansas. I was wondering if you looked at their data. And also, I wonder if any of the folks doing those experiments have looked at mycorrhizal supplementation. Uh, the way Willie Smits restores devastated tropical rainforests with 1,400 species of trees is to plant them with mycorrhizal symbionts, and then they really go to town. Um, so the I know that uh, the, the productivity gains that come from using multiple species is largely because of, of the nitrogen fixing species that are mixed in with the others, and that, that's, uh, I think that's along the lines of what you're, what yeah, you're talking about. They sponsor their own nitrogen fertility yeah. and right. pest resistance and everything else. No inputs. You just sit there and watch it grow, right, right. and then you harvest it with combines or ungulates. Right. That's that's yeah. That's they weren't using the ungulates, but they they were harvesting it. Yeah. That's ex exactly right. And the first part of your question was well, the Land Institute. Okay. They've they've done a lot of great work on perennial polyculture, uh, basically imitating the tall and medium grass prairie because if they're for a better use to wait, better way to use the sunlight, it would have been there already. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure that uh, Dave and Clarence at, at Minnesota uh, are familiar with that, but I'm not. Very great talk. Um, I, I was just going to ask you what you're showing is a lot of, some options are available for going to negative uh, greenhouse gas emissions that can produce liquid, high density liquid fuels. So my question is, do you have a view on where those negative greenhouse gas emission cases you have would lie on the IEA chart on cost for greenhouse gas mitigation? And that would be dependent on the crude price because you're replacing a crude-based barrel. So my question is, have you or anyone else looked at where um, the schemes for negative greenhouse gas so we've, we've looked at, at where sort of the cost of carbon avoided would yes. be uh, for, for some of these systems. Um, and it's be, in, the, in the system I'm most familiar with is the gasification based route. And if you're uh, in, when, when, you, when you do gasification based processing, as you probably know, you're removing CO2 because you need to for, the pro for process reasons and then capturing it as a matter of just compressing it and, and sending it for storage, which is a much cheaper part of the, the overall process. So the, the actual cost of CO2 avoided is pretty low in those, for those systems, um, 20 to $30 a ton on that order. Um, and that's independent of the, of the oil price, essentially. It's just what it costs. Um, but in terms of the cost of production itself, you're, you're quite high. Um, so that so that it's it's almost 
doesn't almost make sense to talk about the cost of CO2 capture in, in that sense. We're, we're talking about 150 or $200 a barrel oil equivalent if, if you don't have any carbon uh, mitigation policy that's incentivizing. Hmm. Hi. There's a company in Berkeley that's <clears throat> doing biochar, you know, pyrolysis, and gasification and pyrolysis on a pallet, you know, for like, uh, comes down to something like two or three cents a kilowatt hour, um, and that's assuming waste product for thing. But I'm thinking you could use, for you mentioned forest residues in, in your slides, and you also talked about, I saw on the slide that when char was taken to combustion, but if you take char to biochar and just put it in the ground, um, you're going to increase water retention and nutrient retention and availability to the plant rootlets. And then he talked about, or Amory talked about the one kind of microrhizome thing. There's also um, compost tea. So you take compost with lots and lots of bugs in it, you brew it for 24 hours in a truck we got in the driveway, and you get 100 gallons of compost tea, which basically inoculates the soil and you get you wind up with what the soil food web lady talked about, which is clusters of these things that surround each rootlet and provide the trans the nitrogen and the minerals in soluble form to it. So the last piece is that the forest with the hundred years of with hundred years of no burn, no no fires allowed you know, as land policy in the United States. We have lots and lots of forests that are way overgrown compared to how it was when it was managed by the indigenous peoples. So we could go through and systematically thin those, turn and chip, you know, take lumber out of it, chip the rest, the soft tissue goes into compost and humus, and that'd be a large scale input. Yeah, so there's lots of points you made there. I think on that last one, the you'd have to look at the costs of doing that, um, and that's, the di sort of the dispersed nature of biomass make, makes it costly generally to, to get it to a facility, but it's worth certainly worth uh, investigating. The uh, you take the pallet off, you do it right on site. So the other the other point on char, I, I should mention. I think there's a GSEP project where biochar is being investigated, and we're actually have in conversation with the folks at I is it Iowa State? I think it's Iowa State University of Iowa, Iowa State, Iowa State. Um, where we're going to take some char from, from their work and, and try it on one of Dave Tillman's plots in, in Minnesota and see what kind of an impact we have there. We, can't, we won't be able to investigate all those things that you've mentioned, but they're, you know, they're worth looking at. Yeah. How do those compare to the cost using corn-based corn -based ethanol or, or um, ca gasoline from fossil fuels? Yeah, so, so uh, um, we, we sometimes show this result in terms of a, of, of a break-even oil cost equivalent, and that would give you some idea. We, we didn't do that here because we're not sure that these things are actually the hydropyrolysis option is a substitute for crude oil. but. In the case of the gasification one, the red, the red one, um, as I mentioned in, to the answer to the earlier question, we're probably at $150 to $200 a barrel equivalent uh, b break even price for oil for that at zero carbon emission price. Okay. Does that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. It's not quite that. Okay. Because there's a uh, refinery a margin involved. There. There. Over 400 million acres in the United States were degraded. Yeah. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Uh, okay. And and there's uh, 300 and some odd million people. It apparently takes about 10 acres of eastern hardwood forest to uh, run a Prius. In other words, to make up for the emissions from a Prius. So that would seem to indicate that there's a pretty short horizon uh, into into the future. 
for this kind of thing to actually work reliably without, you know, without trying to find other places in the world to dump the CO2 into. So what do you have to, to say uh, about are you, that? Are you saying that the absorption of, of yeah. 10 acres is the CO2 equivalent of? Yeah, running a Prius. Of running typical, a Prius. So, uh, typical American. Yeah, so what we're, what we're talking about is growing the biomass on an annual basis. So we're, we're, we're mowing the grass every year and turning right. that into liquid fuel. And that's the fuel that goes into the Prius. Right. And that carbon goes back to the atmosphere and gets absorbed the next year. So it's just a, you know, it's just a cycle. Right. But the net carbon sequestration, you said, is flattening off, is leveling off. Oh, so, so there is a, there, over a hundred year period or so, there's going to yeah. be a leveling of the soil carbon uh, buildup. But there's still, we're still uh, sucking uh, carbon out of the atmosphere as, as right. for geologic storage. Right. Yeah. So it's okay. not... I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, but it's... Well, I'm just, I'm just wondering about the nonlinearity and the eventual thre threshold where it's not going to actually yeah. I mean, be it, profitable, the, environmentally the, profitable. The, the, the important point, I guess, is that we, we need to be, and we're going to look at this, I didn't mention it, but on the, on the demand side, we need to be pushing beyond Priuses as well so that we can yeah. make our renewable resources go that much further. All right, well, thank you very much. Okay.